Welcome to Surviving Sarah. I'm your host, Sarah Bragg, and this show is a place where I get to cheer for how people are contributing to the world and be a megaphone for their story. And I hope that this episode will inspire, encourage, and entertain you to survive right where you are. So if you like this episode, give it a little thumbs up, and if you love it, click the red subscribe button below. Now, pull up a chair and join the conversation. Welcome to Surviving Sarah, episode 140. I'm your host, Sarah Bragg, and this podcast is a place where I get to cheer for how people are contributing to the world and be a megaphone for their story. And I hope that this episode will inspire, encourage, and entertain you to survive right where you are. Sarah Beckman joins me today. She is a mother to three kids between the ages of 17 and 21. And sidebar, if you are a mother entering into the high school phase, I think she would be a great person for you to friend and follow because I think she just has a lot of wisdom because she's one step ahead of you. So you will love to connect with her. But today our conversation is focused around her book, which is called Alongside, A Practical Guide for Loving Your Neighbor in Their Time of Trial. And we have a real practical conversation around how to come alongside someone you know that is walking through a difficult season or circumstance. We talk about loving your neighbor, what that really looks like, excuses that we often give to not step in, and what to do in light of each one of those excuses. And I can't tell you how timely our conversation was. We recorded this episode back in mid-July, and less than two weeks later, I had the opportunity to put into practice what we talked about. Many of you know, if you follow along, a friend of the show, Winter Pitts, she passed away at the end of July, and it was really just shocking and devastating and sad. And, um, and then after that, about two weeks later, my tennis coach died, a a man that I, I deeply loved and had great respect for, and who was influential in my life. And it's just been really a, a hard month of walking through death and walking through what to do. And I, I just don't know what to say ever because I don't really do well with my emotions. And so I was able to reflect back on this conversation and really put into practice some of the things that we talked about. And so I was truly thankful that the timing of this episode happened right in that time frame. I'm so thankful for that. And so I don't know where you are in life. And, you know, it's one of those things that hard times come, you you know that they're going to come. You just may not know when. And so I I hope that this conversation is really helpful for you because it was for me. So pull up a chair and join the conversation. Okay, so now where exactly are you? I know you're in mountain time zone. So where are you? Yes, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. I think I drove through there once, but that's about it. That's what a lot of people say. (laughs) Have you always been there? No, I'm a Midwestern girl born in Wisconsin and then uh, met my husband in Wisconsin at school at the University of Wisconsin. Then we moved to Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, back to Minnesota. And then um, we were mostly Minnesota for 13 years and now um, have been in Albuquerque for six. Okay. Wow. So is that just like work stuff that brought you there? That made y'all move around? Yeah. 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 He's a CEO and a CEO of a water company. And so we moved here for this particular company um, or a particular company, which since has sold. And then um, he actually just, there's another water startup company that he works for yeah. in Albuquerque, which is odd. It's not like a haven. For right. As I said, it doesn't seem, does it seem like there would be like, oh, Albuquerque is known for all the water no, companies. No, it is not. <laughs> and it's not known for water, I can tell you that. Oh, that's so, I know, like hot, like deserty, right? It's, yeah, it's high desert. So it's 5,000 feet and it's hot. But it's not quite as hot as Phoenix, but it's not as cool as Denver. <laughs> Which is very different from where you came, like Wisconsin and Minnesota. Like, very. I call it our domestic overseas assignment. Yes, it would totally yeah. feel that way. I think we, we often don't think about that, like how much of a culture shock it can be, with, even within the United States of moving, just states can be so different. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's literally so, so different. Everything, the topography, the culture, the people, the economics, the, you know, it's just crazy. Now, and you have three kids, is that right? 
Yes. Um, my oldest is 21. My son, he's in college in New York. Um, and then I have a daughter who's in college in Denver. Um, and she's tw 19. So he's going to be a senior. She's going to be a sophomore. Okay. Um, and then I have one that's just going to be starting her senior year of high school. Oh she's 17. Goodness. Wow. So how is this, this phase of life of parenting been for you? Oh man, I'll tell you. It is um, very interesting. It, <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. It really is. I think that I'm so excited that I get to just be friends with my kids for the most part, and we get to just enjoy each other's company. Um, and, you know, there's still, of course, the parenting part, but it just gets less and less intense, and you just start to see that the people that you've been fostering all these years are becoming real people that you love to be yes. with. Uh, I look forward to that. Yes. I look forward to it so much. Sometimes I'll, you know, cast a little vision to my girls and I'll say, you know, about again, back to coffee, like, you know, one day I bet we'll drink coffee together. Like when yes. you're, when you're older and, you know, I just, and people have, I have several, I've talked to several people, um, that have kids in your stage of life and they talk about how hard it is on like, how sweet it is on one hand and how hard it is on another because they are these adults and who are Ooh. fully making their own decisions yet still don't know anything <laughs> you know yes. and, and that phase is hard because it's kind of like I always say we come back to like middle school at different phases in life and I feel like that phase of just out of high school is like a middle school phase again. And and then leaving college at 21 to 22 is a middle school phase again. of like, wait, who yeah. am I and what am I doing? And then, right. so you kind of feel like you're probably parenting again, that same type of little tween, early teenager that you were, but it's different. Yeah. Like my son getting ready to graduate from college is really like kind of bucking this whole notion of real life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, but like, he's thinking about a job and stuff, but then he'll just look at me and say, mom, why do you always have to talk about my job? Like, uh, because when you graduate from college, you get a job. That's what you do. News flash. <laughs> he's like, oh, I'm still in college. I know, but I'm trying to prepare you. Yes. So it's, it's hard. Like I remember being in that phase and like every summer before that year of graduating, I volunteered and served camps. And I remember my dad, like, starting my senior year of college, and he was like, listen, like, next summer, like, you are work you get a job. Like, I you're not on my, like, you're not on my dime. Yes. Like, I love that you've been volunteering and serving, but you've got to get a job. And, and so we were laughing. My, my parents were in town this week, and we were laughing about, I guess, when my brother graduated college, my dad took him on some big trip, like to Wyoming or something. And we, and it dawned on me that I was like, well, when I graduated college, I got a job. Like I didn't, like I started work the next week. <laughs> like where right. was my trip? I, we're, Excuse you know, me. Right. We're 20, I like my back right, pay for right, my right, trip. <laughs> right. We're 20 years late on this trip thing. Like, <laughs> Get back at it, dad. Right. I was like, I feel cheated on this. I'm going to, I'm going to cash in. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. So it is different, but there's so many fun things. I, I was just thinking about the fall and my, my youngest, you know, we've done college tours and she's ready to, she thinks she knows. And, and then, um, but she'll be going to visit. And then my son, it's his senior year of, and he plays soccer in school. So, you know, we're going to be going there and yes, my, my other, my middle daughter is going to be going to Ireland, study abroad. So I'm just sort of like, oh, I get to go to New York for soccer and I'm going to go to Ireland. Yes. For... So you just all of a sudden get to go and have these fun experiences. But seeing them shine instead of you being the tour guide, they get to be. Oh, and I love just, that. Oh, it really is so fun. I mean, there's just, I honestly, we just spent a week at um, at the lake and the kids came and um, and they brought some friends and significance and such. And we had just the most precious week together. We did this funny thing where we made, um, we did an Olympics. Okay. I love this. <laughs> so we had teams of two 
And we did, you know, like rowboat where you had to row out around a buoy, but you each had to have an oar, like each you and your partner, you know, and try and figure out how to row together. This is so fun. (laughs) And then timed it, right? And then we did um, cornhole, like, you know, the beanbag game where you throw it wall, but you had, we had our hand tied to our partner's hand. And then we had to throw together and try and get it in the hole. And we had to get a certain number of points before the timer you know, stopped or whatever. And then we had to run to the other side with our arms tied and, oh, we just had so much fun. And I just thought, I just, like, we've always been gamers in my family, but it was just like fun to enjoy them as human, like adult humans. Yes. You know? Oh, that just makes, I feel like there's going to be a lot of people listening going, oh, now I'm really excited to have like grown kids. Like yeah. I've always been one who's like thinking ahead almost to a fault, but yes. where I can't just enjoy where my people are right now. But, yes. um, but I have a lot of friends who just love these little years and they can't imagine, you know, they don't want them to go to that each next phase. Um, and, but I feel like the more we hear from moms who are at that phase and hear like, you don't need to be afraid. Like it's going to be great and it's going to be fun and you will actually get there. Like, I feel like I'm never going to get there. Like, right. <laughs> I can well, like people, Oh, go ahead. No, I can look back and see how fast it's gone. You know, my girls are eight and 10, but it feels like we're never going to get like to 20, you know? Right. Well, and people ask, you know, how, how do you handle it when they're teenagers or how do you handle it when they go to college? And I really think that there's a reason that you have 13 years Mm -hmm. until they are a teenager, because you will be ready in 13 years. You aren't ready when they're four for them to be 13. But it's just that reminder, like you said, to be where we are right now, knowing that every minute, every hour, every day gets us that backlog of knowledge and experience and history with our kids that allow us to totally know how to parent them. I mean, we will have questions, but we're just way more prepared than we think we'd be because we've had 13 months or 13 years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But then like, that's why you're pregnant for nine months. You're not ready to have a baby tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The minute you find out you're pregnant. So I just think God in his infinite wisdom and timing is very intentional that we don't have to figure out how to handle college till 18 years. Yes. (laughs) We don't have to figure out. And it's the same, like, you know, you get a newborn, and, you know, whether you had that baby or you adopted that baby or foster, whatever, like you get this newborn. And I'm so thankful that you don't have to figure out, like you get this kind of year even before they even start doing anything. <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, I've got time. It is. It's like you right. have the time to prepare for the next phase. And um, exactly. You know. Yes. So you're ready when you need to be ready. Exactly. And that's really an interesting thing that we don't think about. Cause like I do, I am a planner. I'm a look ahead girl. But that's really helped me stay centered on what section of parenting I'm doing. (laughs) And when sometimes the reality is I just need to be pushed off the cliff. Like I can think and think and think and try to like control and prepare and strategize too long. And so sometimes you're like, you know, sometimes I used to think maybe I just needed to have adopted teenagers right then. And like, okay, you are pushed (laughs) out like and you're going to fly and you got to figure it out. Like, you know. Um, but that's so great. Well, I'm excited to talk about your book that, um, that you've written. Uh, I, if you want to give kind of a snapshot of that book, and then we're going to just have a practical and great conversation around that. Yeah. So the book is called Alongside and, um, the subtitle is a practical guide for loving your neighbor in their time of trial. And the less fancy way of saying it is we all know someone in our lives or lots of people that are going through hard things and we often don't know what to do or say. And we may have lots of compassion for what they're facing, but sometimes we lack confidence because we don't actually know how to reach out, how to be there for them, how to come alongside. So this book is filled with practical tools right. to help you. You literally can, my dream was that you would open it anywhere and put your finger down on a page and be able to do something today mm. to that's, love your neighbor or so your good. friend or your family or co Right. Because we all, it's so true. Like, I think we, you know, we all know, unless your head has been buried in the sand for right. your entire life, right? Yes. We all know yes. people who are walking through hard things. Like, 
And I think some of the temptation is to, we compare our hard things and then we think, well, my hard thing is not bad as theirs, or maybe my hard thing is worse. And like, I feel like we just get caught up in so much unnecessary mess when it comes to that in our minds, really. Yes. Yes, we can. Or, you know, quantifying. I think a struggle that, that I've had is that when I see a lot of need, I don't know where to begin. So I do nothing. Yes. And that is kind of crippling and certainly is not what God's best for us is right in the sense of we really are called to love our neighbor. And so that was sort of why I went about this is because I wanted to put meat on the bones. Why? How? I, I understand that he's telling me to do this, but I don't know how. And that's what I was trying to solve. I want to take a quick break from my conversation with Sarah to tell you about today's sponsor, BarkBox. Even though you may regret having a dog at times, oh, wait, (laughs) that's just me. Um, These dogs still make their way into your heart and they quickly become a member of your family. And just like you don't want the human members of your family to have poor quality goods, you you want good stuff for your canine members of your family. And that's why BarkBox is so great. BarkBox is a monthly subscription that you and your dog will love. Every month, BarkBox sends the best all-natural treats and chews and innovative toys to match your dog's unique needs. They design all toys in-house with the very best materials and their all natural treats and chews are made and produced with meat sourced in the USA and Canada. We are so excited to help Murray open his Bark Box. Honestly, I have never seen our dog so happy. Our box contained two squeaker toys and he proudly carried them in his mouth while trotting around the house literally for the entire evening. Each box is delivered to your door for free and contains over $40 worth of toys and treats with subscriptions starting only at $20. For a free extra month of BarkBox, visit BarkBox.com slash survive when you subscribe to a six or 12 month plan. Again, for a free extra month of BarkBox, visit BarkBox.com slash survive when you subscribe to a six or 12 month plan. Now back to the show. Well, what are some some other excuses that we give to Mm. to not stepping in? Like you just talked about how like I, I see too much and I don't know where to start. Like what are some other excuses we have for not stepping in and helping? Uh, I'm too busy. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Um, They have other people, you know, someone else can pick up the slack. Uh, I I don't know what to say. So I'm going to say nothing because I don't want to screw up. Um, Or I don't know what to do. I don't Mm -hmm. know what they need and I don't want to ask what they need. And you know, I don't know anyone to ask what they need. So we just, we just pile up the list. Yes. <laughs> I think, I think one of the things that I've, that I've even felt is that, um, I don't know, maybe there's an insecurity around it. Like I can, maybe this is kind of what you were saying. Like, I feel inadequate. Like who am I like, yes, I care, but you know, I'm not a great cook. So I'm not going to like take food or, you know what I mean? Like there's just so much inadequacy around like feeling like you can't, Maybe you realize you can't solve the problem, but we kind of want to solve the problem because some of us are just fixers and we think maybe if I can do all the right things, it'll actually solve their problem rather than, no, you just need to like come alongside them. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that you're spot on when you say, well, if I can't do this, like that's another excuse we would use. Mm -hmm. I can't cook, so I can't love them. Oh, no, no. Guess what? There's 16 chapters and every (laughs) single, like in the middle, all these chapters are something you can do and you don't have to do what you're not good at. And that's really a myth that's out there that the only thing we can do to help is bring a meal. Yes. That's so not true. Um, Or that the only way you can help is to be a great cook. You know, again, not true. Um, All the things that we sort of have created in our mind as ways that we think people need our help, but really showing up and being brave and stepping out of our box and being present for someone is actually a really valuable something that we can do. We can listen to them and hear their story and be willing to enter into the pain, Mm. which is another kind of excuse people use. I'm not compassionate Uh. or I'm not really good at these messy things. I don't do messy. You know, you know what? Who does? I right. mean, it's we're not really wired that way to begin with. We, there's at some point we have to push ourselves beyond comfort to do the uncomfortable so that we can do what we're called to do. 
which is to, you know, step in and be there and try and make a really bad thing just a little bit better. That's literally, I think, what loving your neighbor looks like. I think you hit it right there and talking about that we don't want to step into the mess, but that is exactly what we are asked to do. And I think it's hard in the culture we live in because we have, we, you know, we live in a culture that's easy for the most part. I mean, we have access to anything we need, you know, I mean, even to the point where yesterday there was something going on in my car and I had my youngest with me and I was like, well, I hope that it doesn't break down because I've got to get to, you know, the store and then we got to get you know, Sinclair from horse and then got to do whatever, whatever. And I was like, oh, well, we could just take an Uber if it happens. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, it can yes. solve every problem instantly without any kind of, you know, so then th- the thought of having to step into someone's mess where you already feel like maybe you have too much mess of your own, where, you know, you maybe you have a hard kid or you have a hard marriage or you have all these factors. We moved or, you know, like there's so much of my own mess. So then the thought of stepping into someone else's mess you just like, it's just too much. So I'm just not going to do it. But that's exactly what we're supposed to do as, as humans and as children of God to step in to someone else's mess. Yes. And I I wouldn't say we have to step into every mess either. And that's That's something that I really address um, as well is just this notion of like, who is yours to help and who isn't. And that has been really powerful for me. It helps me find freedom in knowing that there are some people I'm definitely called to help and others I'm not. And so I've created what's called the relationship tiers um, or levels. So you would have a relationship level one, two, three, four. And the relationship tier one is the people that you are closest to, your mom, your sister, your best friend, you know, your people. Yeah. Um, and then two is, you know, we're still really close. We hang out on weekends. We see each other at church, but they're not my number one you know, people. And then tier three, again, you know, people we see on the soccer field, but we're not socializing, but we still definitely know them and say hello and maybe have conversations. We're just not social outside of that. And then, you know, tier four might be an association like my sister's friend's kid, you know, and I don't know them, but I know my sister and I'm feeling bad for her. So I maybe want to do something because I'm aware of the situation. So, I, I've tried to sort of weave through the book this notion of relationship tiers that you would be able to know what's appropriate and what's not throughout like someone's trial. So for example, it would be very insensitive if I am a tier one and my friend loses their loved one and like let's just say it's your best friend's mm-hmm. mom. And if all you did was send a card. Right. That would be so impersonal and you might literally lose a friendship over it. Right. 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 And I'm using an extreme just to help you understand. But then like if you were a tier three or four and you sent a card, they'd be like, oh my gosh, you're never going to believe who sent me a card. (laughs) Well, I love that you used even for like the tier three or four, like sending a card is good. And we're going to get to these practical things, but I love that because sometimes we just always think big, we have to go big or go home, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. But, but, really just stepping back and thinking to yourself, okay, there is a lot of need, but who is mine to help? Are they a one or two? Do I not get to have a hall pass in this situation? Are they a three? I, but I, but I really feel compelled by the spirit, by situation, by whatever to actually just do something instead of nothing. But then you can do one thing and move on mm. and not feel like I have to be their person through their whole tri- whole trial. But it just helps give us freedom yes. because then we can kind of categorize instead of just do nothing. I think that is such a good, helpful um, thing that you just said of just, you got to think through because I do think there's a lot of us who feel the pressure to do it all and to yes. help all the people. And there's a, there's a people pleasing aspect of that. And there's a, you know, I don't want people to think I don't care. I mean, it's the same thing that we as women wrestle through, whether with anything, even down to like why we get involved with our kids' schools or anything. Like it's, it's that same, our motivation is sometimes not the purest motivation. Like we feel just compelled out of pressure that we've got to do this when you're going, it's okay if you're not 
you know, this person is not even close to you. Like there are other people who can serve this person. Like it's okay. Right. That's yes, exactly right. And it gives us this freedom to say like, if you, if you don't have a one or a two in your life right now, you will. Yes. You yes. know, save yourself, but do something. And then you know that you can just say, yes, I feel good. And we aren't, I just don't want people walking around plagued by guilt that they didn't do something. And I also really don't want people losing valuable friendships because they didn't even try to show up and be there for someone in the hardest time of their life. Yes. Okay. Well, let's, I feel like this is a good segue into, let's, let's unpack some of these excuses with the house. Like, you know, let's, let's take that apart. Cause I think, you know, we definitely don't want to lose friend friendships because we go, well, I was just too busy and I just didn't know, or I was too overwhelmed. And so I didn't know where to, where to help. Or I, you know, I just feel too inadequate because I can't really solve anything. And so I just didn't do anything because I would definitely don't want people to lose relationships. So let's kind of put some practical, um, things to do in combat to these excuses. So, so yeah, like, let's maybe start with the, I'm, I'm too busy to help. And which is so funny because when you think about, like you ask anybody these days, like, how are you? They go, I'm busy. And you're like, busy is not <laughs> even an emotion. Like I'm asking you how you, like, it's not mm-hmm. even, you know, it's not. And, and so, but yet that's what we're all, we all are busy. Like there is no one that is not busy, like in our day and time. So in our right. phase of life, we're all busy. So we can all know that like every single one of us are there, but that's not an excuse to not help. So what, what can we do when we feel too busy to help? Yes. Well, first of all, I just want to say, I love that busy is not an emotion. So thank you for that <laughs> word. That is such a word. I'm sitting here writing it down going, whoa, my blown. <laughs> oh, I love that. Like it just really is meaningful because I think we just forget about how people really are feeling. Like, I want to know how you are feeling, not what you are, what you are. is Right. Are you angry? Is it, are you tired? (laughs) Like, because I think that's what we're getting at. Like we're saying I'm busy because, which means I'm just tired because I'm doing so much, but that's not an emotion. Right. Oh, so I just had to pause and jump up, but I will get back to your question. I just love that. Mic drop right there. Yes. (laughs) Preach it. That was good. So, um, as far as being being busy, the best way I have found to combat my busy life and schedule is to uh, do something that I'm already doing and and then be able to help someone in need that way. And by that, I mean, I go to Target. I go to the grocery store. I drive my kids places. I mean, now not as much. I have all, you know, they all drive. But when I was driving to dance or to church or to sports, I'm doing a lot of busy things. And so you can offer to do what you're already doing to bless your friend, family, coworker, neighbor. So I'm going to target, what can I pick up for you? I'm already there. Yes. And so there's no excuse. You put a little corner in your cart and you put their stuff in that corner and you drop it on the way home. Yes. (laughs) Yes. It's perfect. Um, Yep. And you can drive to soccer and say, I'm going anyway. I will pick up your kid for the next, the whole season, I'll come every Tuesday and Thursday and just be the driver. I can do that for you. I'm already going. So it's just my favorite way to combat busy is offer what you're already doing. You know, it makes me think about, I feel like there's an excuse that happens on the recipients end sometimes too, when you're thinking, I'm going to text and say, Hey, I'm at target. What do you need? Sometimes people feel so like, I don't know what the word is. They they don't want to impose on people. At yeah, least, they're bur- they feel like a burden. Yes, especially in the South, I see that a lot. But you know, like a fr- one of my best friends, you know, was going through. They're tr- they were trying to sell a house and it fell through. And I just texted her and I was like, "Hey, I'm at Starbucks. Can I get you something?" And she was like, "No, no, really." It's, I was like, "No, no. Coffee is my love language. So I'm. I know that I would need coffee in this moment of finding out that like my house just fell through. So." what, what do you want? And it was like pushing her enough to go, okay, I really do want coffee, but I just didn't want to like impose. And it's like, okay, this is a $3 like help that I'm giving you. And then it show up and just sit for 30 minutes and like talk and it's helping push. Sometimes we have to push our recipient going, no, I really like, this is truly like, I am at target. I will pick you up, you know, 
pull-ups or whatever it is that you're needing in life, you know, um, it's not an imposition for me. Right. And so it's all about how we phrase it too. And so even, um, I had a friend pull this on me and she said, I'm at Target. What's your order? Mm. Or I'm at, I'm at Starbucks. What's your order? Sorry. Um, but you know, like, to even to the point where I was like, oh, she's already there and she's ordering and she wants to know what I want, you right. know? So not, can I get you something, but what is your order? Yes. Like this is a foregone conclusion. I'm doing it. So even just that little subtle nuance of That's like great. pushing it to the next level. And I said, I thought, oh gosh, I, well, okay. She's already there and she's clearly buying herself a drink. And so I'll let her get it. And Then later she's like, you know, I totally used your book on you. And I was like, what? (laughs) She's like, yeah, I made a specific offer, which is one of the chapters. And I asked you about what your Starbucks order was. And I said I was already there and she was, but like, I thought, oh my gosh. And it's easier for them to receive it. Yes. Rather than asking a question, like, would you like something? It's yes. I'm bringing you dinner. Like I had another, when we moved here, my, another best friend, she just texted me and she said, I'm bringing you dinner tonight. Um, would you rather have chicken pot pie or tacos? Yes. So there was no like, you know, does this work out? Like whatever. He's like, no, I'm bringing you dinner tonight. So, yes. um, and it is, if you just become like imperative versus, you know, giving a question. Uh, yes. Yeah. And you only offer what you can do, which is great because then it's like they understand the way you you would offer something is that you're literally capable of doing it. Not you know, oh, if you think that maybe you might want a meal, I could probably drum up a dinner and would, do you like spaghetti? You know, it's just like, what? Right, right. You know? Yeah. Okay. So on that, you know, one of the other excuses, well, I can't cook. Like, I don't know how, like I'm, you know, or I, you know, I live across town and I can't get you a meal fast enough or, you know, so what do you do like when it comes to like, let's just say food, let's get specific about, you know, are there go-to meals or is there advice on how to figure out how to help someone with food if food is the need? Yeah. So I have, I kind of have two thoughts on that. Number one, if you really aren't a food cook person or even don't know how to go on the internet and order a pizza <laughs> to be delivered. We have bigger <laughs> then, problems if that's the case. <laughs> then I am going to give you my advice for that is that you really, that's not the only way you can help. And I really want people to hear that. I would definitely address the food thing because it really does apply to a lot of people, but it is not the only way you can help. And um, one of the other things that people forget is that I'm, I love to cook. It's, it's, it's your coffee love language. Mine is making food for people or my kids or sending them their favorite food or whatever. But if you are a gardener, if you are like a totally organized person, if you are a scrapbooker, if you are a, you know, a curator of great gifts or whatever your thing is that you're good at, you can offer that instead of offering food. So I've had people that have gone to friends' houses and literally like organized closets or kitchens. Or um, when I was having back surgery, I had a friend that literally was like the best shopper and she created a little business out of it. And she had to, she did all my daughter's birthday shopping. It's amazing. Because that was her gift. Yes. And she offered that to me in my time of trial because her birthday was coming up. And I have another friend who loves to wrap presents. And she offered to wrap all those gifts that the friend bought, you know, just, I mean, there's really a lot of ways we can bless people, you know, hairdressing, massage, yard work, cleaning. I mean, any of it. I mean, I've had it all. I really have. Um, So do what you're good at and offer that. That's really my advice. If food's not your thing. Okay. So I love that you said that because I think it goes back to what we said earlier that sometimes we we are doing things because we feel like we have to. Um, mm-hmm. You'll get put on a meal train for someone at work um, that had a baby or that yeah. something happened. And, you, and you're like, gosh, I don't need, I, like, I don't even live. Like for me, like, I, you know, I work part time contractually for a nonprofit that's an hour away. So I'm not like, yes, I'm in the office with these people like once a week, but I'm not like a, I can't just stop by and bring you dinner because that's just not. Yeah, I don't live close enough to do that, but it's like you feel compelled because of like social reasons or you don't people pleasing reasons. You don't want people to yes. think that you don't care, but it's going, it's going to be okay 
if you figure out your unique wiring and what you're really good at that you could offer that could really be a tangible, helpful thing to that person and it's not a meal. It's okay to figure that out and just leave your name off the meal train. It's okay. Like It is okay. Right? I, I am absolving you of bringing <laughs> yes. the meal. That's not your thing. But so I have a friend who lives in Minnesota and now we'll talk a little bit about food. You know, proximity could be one thing or gifting in that area could be another. Yes. Um, so she was having knee surgery and I found a local pizza place and I texted her and said, I'm going to have pizza delivered to your family. Here's the restaurant and the menu. Please tell me your order. It's perfect. And, and then I called the restaurant, ordered the pizza, the salad, the, te- you know, the dessert monkey bread business, whatever. Yes. yes. And you know, maybe I spent a little more, but she's like a tier one tool in yes. my life. Yes. And so I wasn't going to leave her hanging, but I don't live there. Right. And so I ordered the pizza and she just, I mean, the text was like, you just can't even know how helpful this was that it wasn't just random. It was something personal to them. Um, but like we, when our dog died, someone called us or texted my husband from his office and said, um, we're having Dion's pizza delivered to your family tonight. What kind do you like? I mean, it was so meaningful to us. Just, I mean, we were just sad and it was just like, what are you going to do? You have to eat. So there are ways to do it. If you're not a cook, if you are, if you love cooking, if that's your thing, then, but you still are like perplexed or are sitting on Pinterest, you know, scrolling Uh, and trying to figure out what gourmet thing to bring. And I need it to be excellent and immaculate and Mary. Martha Stewart, Mary, yes. listen to me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just Rachel Ray, who are some, Giada, whatever, Barefoot Contessa. But I really think that the best gift you can give someone when you're bringing food is to bring them your best, which means what are you serving your family that they like? And you said it earlier, it's your go-to. Yes. What is your go-to? And if you bring that to every time you need a meal for someone then you just get really good at it and you, it, it goes faster. It's easier. You don't, all the things are taken out of the equation, the uncertainties, the unknowns, and you're just good at it. Like I'm bringing a meal for someone on Sunday and I've been out of town for six weeks. Oh gosh. So when I got my, <clears throat> the meal train, yep. uh, I signed up for green chili chicken enchiladas cause I can do it in my sleep. Yeah. You know, yes. So and you can make things like that. Like, okay, I can also feed my family that and just make enough that I can serve to the people I'm taking food to. Yes. And that's another really great strategy as you know, just kind of answers all of the questions. I'm busy. And if I don't know what to do about food, make double of what you already make for your family. It's real easy. And if your family eats it, they're going to eat it. Yep. Right. I mean, So it's, there's just so many ways that we put up barriers and we do make excuses. And partly it's because maybe we just don't want to, or we don't want to create the time. But when we cultivate a mentality of, I can, there's a lot of things that we can do to love someone in their trial. Instead of immediately cultivating that thought of, I'm too busy. I can't, this is, you know, all the reasons we can't, then we will certainly find reasons not to. Support for this episode comes from RX Bar. If you opened up my own survival kit, you'd find an RX Bar. I love them because of the fact that they tell me right up front what ingredients are in each bar. The bars are gluten-free, soy-free, and dairy-free with no artificial colors or artificial flavors, preservatives, or fillers. Only real whole food ingredients. The adult bars come in 14 different flavors. My personal favorite is the chocolate sea salt. I mean, hello, they had me at sea salt. They don't have the typical protein bar taste. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Most bars to me just taste fake, but RX Bar are truly delicious and they have kid bars too which is so great because protein bars is a staple in my kids lunch boxes and with rx bar i know up front the quality they will enjoy they're going to have the same whole food ingredients as the adult bar just smaller and kid-friendly flavors rx bars are perfect for a snack or a quick meal on the go i usually keep a bar in my purse so that when i'm tempted i'm hungry and i'm tempted to stop in the fast food drive through line i can just cruise right past rx bar is offering you an exclusive pack of six adult bars and four kid bars so that the whole family is able to enjoy. 
For 25% off your first order, visit rxbar.com slash survive and enter the promo code survive at checkout. Again, for 25% off your first order of a pack of six adult bars and four kid bars, go to rxbar.com slash survive and enter the code survive at checkout. Okay, so there's one more excuse I want us to tackle, and that's the one that I think a lot of us fall into, and it has to do with like words. Like, um, you just don't know what to say, you know, when especially when something really hard um, happens, that there's a death or a tragedy, and we just don't know what to say. Um, and so, how can we um, maybe discern between helpful and unhelpful things to say? when someone's going through a hardship. Right. Oh, this this is so, um, this is probably the number one question. And of course the number one excuse, because we have heard all the horror stories of people saying the wrong things. Yes. But really I, I created just a little simple acronym. Um, there is a whole chapter about words. So just FYI, if anyone's listening and they like want, they're going to want more on that. It's there's, we cover it more than what we're going to talk about (laughs) today, but it's called, um, acknowledge, affirm, express. So first you would just acknowledge their situation. Like, I'm so sorry to hear that you lost your dad, right? Just simply expressing it out loud. Um, the I'm sorry for your loss is okay. If you can't think of anything else to say, or I'm sorry about, Well, I mean, I guess like about your cancer or your house or whatever. I mean, just, I'm sorry, but like, if you try to just acknowledge it in a way that isn't generic, it really helps because they feel seen Mm -hmm. instead of just like, that was the first and easiest thing to say. Right. Yeah. Um, and then like affirming their feelings, you know, I, I can't imagine like you must just be feeling such great pain right now in this time. Um, you know, something like that. And if they've expressed anything about how they feel, like if they say, Oh, I'm just crushed or it's so overwhelming right now, this move, or, you know, I can't imagine waking up tomorrow, not being able to call my mom, whatever they say, you know, then you can affirm their feelings, like affirm what they say instead of putting feelings into their mouth, right. (laughs) By saying, so does that make sense? Like you must Um, feel this way. Like, is that what you're meaning? Like I'm I'm projecting that onto them. Yes. We don't want to do that if we can help it. So if they've said anything like, yeah, it's so draining, you know, gosh, I can't imagine how draining that must be. And then you can expound on it, but it's just to take their verbal cues. I mean, this is sort of basic communication, but mm-hmm. it really matters. And it, and we really do have more power than we think in these situations where we feel powerless because there are always cues if we are willing to like watch and listen and follow them. Um, and then really just expressing our empathy, um, expressing that we're going to be there, expressing that, you know, we're going to keep, we're going to get you through this. You know, we aren't going to forget you. We're standing with you. We're here for you. Um, you know, we will, we won't forget about you. We're going to, we're going to follow up with you in a week or two, you know, when things calm down and, and we're going to be there to help you get through this, you know, those kinds of things. So first we affirm, like we acknowledge their, um, their situation. Then we affirm their feelings and then we express our empathy. That's just kind of like a generic way to think about it. Or you could just do one of those three. Anything is better than just, and I also think it's important to kind of, sometimes you'll be caught out, you know, you'll be in the grocery store at church or in the cubicle or in the coffee room or, you know, wherever you might not know it's coming, but if you do know you're going somewhere where you're going to see the person, think it through. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with being a little bit intentional about thinking through what you might say so that it doesn't just stumble out. Like, I'm sorry for your loss or, oh, they're in a better place. You know, they might be in a better place, but that's not your place to say that to them until they say it first, Mm. because it will really hurt people if you say something that's true, but maybe just not helpful in that moment, because nothing can bring their person that they love back. Right. And hearing that they're in a better place, all they want is for them to be in this place. Yes. Right now. I think that's that, um, that verse, you know, God, well, God works all things together for good. 
And uh, you're like, I don't see any good right now. Like right? I remember professor in seminary talking about that verse and saying, you know, there's, there's some promises in the Bible that are a present promise. There's some promises that are like a future promise, like, like kingdom promise. And then there's some that right. might be both. And he's like, this one that's like, doesn't mean that, it, that they may not ever feel like this was ever good in this life. And so by saying right. that, it just is like, it cheapens what happened to them. Totally. That was, that's really profound, Sarah. I think very wise. We, we don't get to decide for them if it's good right now or if it'll be good later. Right. Yes. That's not our decision to make for them. And it does cheapen it. And it really actually just, it it's us trying to put like silver linings yes. on their situation. And our job really is to show up and sit in the mess. And I'm reminded of Job. Uh, of course, when, when he lost everything the first time and his three friends showed up and they sat with him for seven days and they did not speak. They sat for mm -hmm. seven days. And of course that Jewish tradition of sitting Shiva, but so often we show up, but then we start speaking and that's yes. when we get in trouble. <laughs> and well, once Job's friends started talking, they did, <laughs> they get, did get in, in trouble. trouble. Right. <laughs> but I think that's so true because I think so many of us just want to fix the problem and we don't want to see our friends hurting. And so we don't want them to walk through anything painful, right. but we all know that every protagonist of the story walks through something really hard that has the potential to really direct the next phase of the book, you know, the next right. phase of the story. And sometimes we just, we have to let them walk through it without trying to make sure no one walks through anything hard or that it's solved really quickly. Cause it's just, it's just hard to be the person who's standing alongside them watching. And, and I think I, I remember, trying to do that because I'm a fixer. I'm like, oh, I can see X, Y, and Z. This is what we need to do. To, then I don't like to feel anything. I don't like to feel emotion. So let's just like push through. That's kind of just yes. my personality. And so learning to do that with my children, like if they're sad or if they're hurting about something and learning to just know, I think I just need to sit here and let not, not try to speak and not try to, you know, other than like, well, how are you feeling? And not say like, okay, what do we need to do? <laughs> Cause that's usually right. my, my, my next thing is action and learning to just sit in the mess, but it's just uncomfortable. But it goes back to what you said in the beginning that we're, we're not always called to just be comfortable, but we're called to step into the uncomfortable with people. And sometimes that just means being silent and that's okay. Yeah, so true. And I love that you tied it back to parenting. I was thinking that right as you were speaking, because really that is a huge part of every stage of our kids' lives, that when we're just willing to be in the listening mode instead of the fixing mode, that's really what they need. I mean, we should assume that every little hard step in their life is almost like a mini trial for them. It's the biggest thing in the world, right? right. All they care about is their little universe. Right. And so it is a trial. And I remember when we moved from the Midwest to Albuquerque, you know, 1500 miles and my kids were 10th, 8th and 6th grade. Wow. And it was a trial for all of us. But like as the mom, I had to figure out how to come alongside my kids and it was, you know, long before the book was written and all the things, but just thankful for the Lord's wisdom that taught me that there was lots of times that I had to just be willing to sit in the tears with them and let them be sad because I could not take them back to yep. Minnesota. Yes, I had to just feel the feelings with them. And that meant so much. And I think we just undervalue that listening is a valuable something Yes. that we can do. It's just as valuable as bringing a meal or going to Target or driving the carpool, even more so because so few people, we do not foster a culture of listening in America. Yeah, <laughs> of taking the time to sit with someone and just listen. Right. Yeah. And it is a valuable something and not fixing and not, you know, giving them platitudes or saying unhelpful things, even if they're true, right. you know, that's the kind of words, like when you're not sure what words, maybe use no words. That's yeah. a pretty good rule of start thumb. there, start <laughs> there and give it a lot of time and figure yes. it out. Yeah. That's good. Yes. Okay. This is so helpful. Um, okay. So the last question I ask everyone, um, may have nothing to do with anything of importance. So, um, 
I just, and, and my listeners love this question. I hear all the time from listeners how they love this question. They're always excited to hear answers. But um, what is helping you survive these days? If you had a little magical survival kit, what would we find in it? Oh, man. So I would say the simple answer is vegetables. Okay. Um, but I will give you a little explanation. Okay. Um, my, I, you know, I think a lot, I don't know. I struggle with making good choices when it comes to food, especially in times of stress oh, or yeah. in sur- when I'm in survival mode. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. And so um, I just finished literally yesterday, um, turned in my manuscript draft for my second book. And leading up to that, I was really just kind of fighting with this, like, you know, too much dependence on coffee and sugar and carbs. <laughs> I don't know and, what you're talking about. I don't know. I know. <laughs> I know. We do not relate with one another. On right. This. Uh, <laughs> or any of the listeners. <laughs> but so, um, and I, you know, I mean, everyone's at different places in their weight and I'm all about positive body image and all that stuff, but I also want to feel good. So that was really the bottom line. I didn't feel good. I was not making choices that made me feel good about who I was and my body and just the, like almost the lethargy and the inactivity and just whatever. So I was at a bookstore with my daughter. We love books, you and I too. Mm-hmm. And I found this book called Metabolism Revolution. And without going into a big, long story, it basically is like an eating plan where it teaches you about how to kind of cut through your metabolism threshold. And I felt like I really applied, this book really applied to me because I'm like 48 years old and I would eat all the same things for all these years. And then all of a sudden I gained like 15 pounds. Yes, it didn't work anymore. I'm still eating the same things. I'm still, I still love my treats and I still drink coffee. And anyway, so it it felt like it really applied to me. But what I loved about it is that it, I could eat real food and I didn't have to starve myself and I didn't have to sit and count my calories. And it also had recipes in the book. And so I could come up, I could use the plan. Like I like a prescription and a plan. And so I bought the book. I read half of it in the bookstore that morning. I bought the book. And my husband decided to do it with me. And it's really just a two week plan and it's prescribed, you know, in the morning you eat one protein, two vegetables, you know, one fruit, blah, blah, blah. Like it's just literally like that. And there's a huge list of foods you can eat. And there's some foods that are on the no eat list because they sort of mess with your metabolism. And when you're trying to kickstart it, it just kind of screws you up. So I, yeah. And in the middle of all this, uh, I was working on my rough draft for my manuscript. And I was spending 10 and 12 hour days in the office writing. And in the past, I would have had my coffee and my chocolate and my sugar and like bring me soup and bring me bread and, you know, just all of the comfort. All the comfort. Yeah. But in the middle, I thought there's no way that I could do this two week plan in the middle of this. And my husband's like, no, I think we can. I think it might actually help you because, you know, if you're going to the office every morning, we can just, you can pack your 10 o'clock snack and your lunch and your afternoon snack, and then we'll have a healthy dinner. And I couldn't believe it that in the middle of book writing, I could do this. And I will tell you that my mind was more sharp Mm. than it has been in so long. And I lost weight and I feel so much better. And so it really, like my husband jokes and calls it the veggie tsunami <laughs> because you eat so many vegetables, right. but you're also eating protein and sugar and complex carbs. And but we're just, just not help. used to eating. Right. So much of us are just not used to eating vegetables like that. We just go yeah. to all the other so things. We, we were eating four cups of vegetables in the morning. Wow. That's a lot. Like for breakfast, the first, you know, and it's like I said, it's only two weeks and then you can kind of go back to like a for life plan of just what should I be choosing to eat? And so I'm still like eating vegetables. So I was traveling yesterday and I packed my cut up carrots and my, you know, my fruit and I just, and my like raw nuts and I just know what to do. And so it's, it, there's so many things woven into the word vegetables, but it's just like when I don't know what to choose, I'm choosing a vegetable. Yes. Making a and, better choice on that. And it's still hard every time I have to choose a carrot, but like the longer I do it, the more, be- the better I feel. And I really just think like, 
I survived writing a book, which you know is a hard endeavor. And not only did I survive, but I like totally thrived. I lost 10 pounds. That's incredible. I, I feel great. And and my husband and I did it together. He lost weight. Like our kids were like, mom, you look so good. You know, just like, wow. And I wrote a book. So vegetables. Exactly. <laughs> that is a good survival kit. I think other people are going to be like, I'm going to look into that. Like that sounds pretty great. Yeah. And it can be any plan, but really yes. it was about for me, just about a choice. And yes. Yeah. That's good. Well, thank you for hanging out with me today. Oh, my pleasure, Sarah. What a fun time to chat with you. I feel like we're kindred spirits. Sarah gave so much practical advice in this episode and helping others truly can, for some of us, feel overwhelming. And and I don't know about you, but when I feel overwhelmed, I just don't do anything. I allow all the excuses from keeping me from stepping in. The excuses like, you know, I, the things that I say are, I don't know what to say or who am I to step in or they have people. I'm just like this fringe person or, um, and, and so I just allow the inadequacy to kind of overwhelm me. But Sarah said, when we cultivate a mentality of I can, there's a lot of things we can do to love someone in their trial. I mean, that is so good and so helpful. And I do, I think we just need to cultivate a mentality of I can. So what did you think about today's conversation? You know, I want to hear about it. Please come find me at Sarah W. Bragg on Instagram or Twitter or Surviving Sarah Podcast on Facebook. And remember to click the little subscribe button wherever you listen to the show so that you will never miss an episode. Don't forget to head over to survivingsarah.com to find the show notes for today's conversation with Sarah, which includes links to everything we talked about, discussion questions, if you want to join together with some other people to listen to the show and talk about it, and ways to connect with her. And many thanks to BarkBox and RX Bar for sponsoring this episode. Please take advantage of the deals that they offer because that is just a really great way to show the show some support. Thank you for listening. And as always, I hope this show helps you survive a little easier. 